everyone. Today's presentation is called Computing Before Computers, from Counting Board to Slide Law. It's given by David Eglin, whose whole career has been with computing companies as a hardware person, including Ferranti Computers and ICL. David will be looking at the variety of computing and analog devices used in aids to arithmetic calculations and in analog devices. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, okay, now, oh, the thing that's missing is a little clock in the corner of the screen, which was there, it's disappeared, so I have to keep an eye on the time. Um, okay, let's make a start then. Why did I put this, this talk together? Press the button again. Any problems before we start here? That's it, that's it. Wrong button, wrong button. Um, the thing that started this was thinking about how you design and build Roman buildings without knowing the value of pi or being able to calculate um, with Roman numerals because they're obviously quite impossible to can't calculate with. Um, as it turns out, you don't need to, but it's all done with geometry. But that's a different story altogether. Um, okay, so how do we cope with uh, Roman numerals and so on? Um, we've got no paper, so we can't do uh, laborious hand calculations with uh, Roman numerals. Uh, then comes the rise of Indo-Arabic numbers. Arithmetic machines we're going to talk about. Roman human calculators. Babbage, briefly, um, mathematics uh, machines, <coughs> which use analog uh, uh, for numbers, uh, tables and slide rules, and then electronic computers, which we, we know all about anyway, so not going to be done with. Okay, um, I want to get these two things out of the way, first of all. We have experts on the Antica theory, <coughs> so they're not going to talk about it, even though it's christened the first uh, computer. And I'm also not going to talk about this thing called the Roman abacus. <coughs> it looks just like a Japanese abacus. I can't find a picture of an original one. The, all the pictures are of replicas of this thing, so um, nobody seems to know anything about it. And in fact, um, I doubt if it's widely used because the counting board, which we're going to look at first, is a much better device for doing uh, Roman numeral calculations. So I'm not going to talk about these two. Um, first of all, counting boards. These are simple boards laid out with uh, lines on a board or a table. It's where we get the word counter from in, in a shop. Um, and this is how we do calculations with Roman numerals. Um, here's an example of a lady doing the household accounts with her servant using a counting board. Um, a big time merchant here with a very large counting board on his, on his table um, and it's labelled at the side here in ones, tens, hundreds and thousands <coughs> um, and that's obviously meant to impress the customers. So how does it work? We've got units, tens, hundreds, thousands Intermediate things to do with fives and put it between the lines. So this number here is 3,600, um, which is a, a 501, um, 70, which is 50 and 2 tens, and then 7, which is <coughs> 5 and 2 tens. So let's do a bit of arithmetic with this. We're going to add 33 to it and um, we'll put those on the other side of the line to start with and then first of all simply slide them over and um, this in fact represents a perfectly good Roman numeral you can write it down it's an unambiguous uh, perfectly good number but what we need to do is get it into let's call it a normal <coughs> form so we just now work our way up the uh, up the board to do that we take away these and put on a five I would take away two fives and put on a ten and then we've got six tenths here, so we need to take away those. Sorry, one missing. Well, there are six. Six have gone away, so we need to put five up there. And we've got one left on the on the line. And similarly, we've now got two fifties. Sorry, yeah, two fifties making up a hundred. Another hundred on the line, <coughs> and that's the final number. 
So it's simply a matter of sliding the, the counters over and then consolidating uh, the thing into, into normal form. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to try this. There are lots of things in the literature about this. But I think simply by drawing another line down, you could easily cope with multiplication. It'd be a little bit tedious, but it wouldn't be too difficult at all. Um, so this, this was the way to deal with, uh, with Roman numerals. There we go. What you use on the board, um, in Roman times, it was, it was said to be pebbles, which is where, of course, you all know where we get the word calculate from. Um, but in fact, I think the Romans probably had purpose-made counters, little blobs of glass you see sometimes, and things like that. In later times, the, the counters came to be purpose-made things. The, I've got a, a couple of examples here. You please take this out of the packet if you want to. Um, they're just like thin coins. They were um, made mainly in Nuremberg. Um, they're very, very common. The uh, so, uh, 15 were found in the Mary Rose. I've got one was found in Carby because that's the nearest one I could find to Manchester. Um, they're frequently dug up by uh, metal uh, collector people, metal detector people. Um, the rich are supposed to use silver jettons. Uh, the king used gold. <coughs> um, and this is the first example of what. Oh, sorry. Uh, what the. Um, if there's a theme through this talk, it's boys' toys. <laughs> nothing, nothing very academic about it, but um, it's a constant thing that keeps coming up. And um, if you're going to get these things in silver, then really they become boys' toys, don't they? That you don't need silver for them. Um, so it was a, I didn't use this word, medallic instincts. It's in one of the textbooks about, uh, about these things. In Germany, um, every year for good luck, you threw away your stock of jettons into the river and got some new ones, which was great for the brass trade in Nuremberg because everybody renewed them. Um, and so we've got, we've got a couple here. Uh, these are metal detector people finds, loads and loads of them. I mean, probably all Nuremberg. I can see one here, which is very clearly a Nuremberg one. It's like the, the one on the table there. Um, they were made in France as well, probably here as well, I don't know. But, uh, these are the things that metal detector people dig up. These are very common forms of uh, Nuremberg jetons. They, um, they're just like coins, but they're very thin compared to a real coin. The boards um, are something of a mystery. Um, I'm a member of a furniture society which is mainly interested in oak furniture, and we had until he died recently the country's greatest expert in oak furniture. So I asked him, have you ever seen these scratch marks on a board or on a table, maybe underneath the table? Um, because these people at this society always have torches and they look underneath everything. Um, and he said, no, I've never seen one. But what I have seen is this statement in a, a will inventory, which looks like a description of a, a counting board. Um, there are two examples uh, you can find on the internet, both in Germany. I think this one's on in the Jewish Museum. And there's a, a cloth upstairs next door which looks looks very much like this. Yeah, uh, a cloth rather than a, a marked out board. But they are, there must be some in Britain somewhere, underneath the table or behind a bookshelf in a library or something. Nobody's ever seen one. Now this um, same technique was used on, on a national scale the exchequer comes from uh, a description of a carpet laid out in squares, like the uh, drawing here. Um, and this was used to do the national accounts twice a year. The sheriffs were responsible for collecting the taxes. They came to the exchequer office. Um, I think they were probably had stolen silver, so they probably had a way to make sure the coins corresponded to the actual value. Uh, that they were bringing back. And in the exchequer, there was this large table with a carpet on it or a cloth on it marked out in squares. And the, um, the proceedings went on by uh, whatever they want. I don't, I don't know like, the details of what happened on this table. Um, but it's, it's well described. Uh, I think it's just on the next slide. 
Here we are, yes. There's this really nice document, if you, <coughs> if you want to go all the way through it, called The Dialogue Concerning the Exchequer. Yeah. And um, I found it on the Princeton Law School website, uh, not in Latin, of course, but in translated into English. Um, and it describes all the procedures that go on around the Exchequer. Now, the way in which um, this was uh, not recorded so much, that was done on uh, uh, rolls, um, but the sheriffs went away with a record of how much tax could be collected in the form of tally sticks. And this is simply a piece of wood, or a stick rather, not a piece of wood. Um, and this document lays out how you make these in very, very great detail. You have small marks for uh, pennies and shillings, larger marks for pounds, and larger marks again for hundreds. So a tally stick was made <coughs> with the amount of the sheriff is to bring back in six months' time. <coughs> it was cut with these uh, marks to say how much it was, and then it was split in two. Um, this is the splitting in two this is was the important part because then when you marry the two together, um, you know you've got the, uh, the same thing. And I've attempted to make a, a, a small one here, it's on the table, um, and it's marked out with uh, shillings and hundreds, I think, yeah. Um, and in the, in the room where the exchequer was being done, there was a guy whose title is the tally, tally maker. He, he did it on the spot. Now, having got these documents, um, the, uh, very, very rapidly, the king said, oh, I've got the record here, what's owing? We have to make some money out of this. So, <laughs> starting the, the national debt by uh, raising money on the, the tally stick. <coughs> um, also, it said that Wall Street was found in where it is because there's a tree. There was a huge tree at the end of that street, and you can chop the uh, branches <coughs> off the tree to make tally sticks. And the Bank of England used them <coughs> until a surprisingly late time. So the, these are uh, important documents. And um, what have we got here? Oh, here's a picture of some of them. The amount of money owing and um, who is owing it and so on is written on the tally stick. I think there's only none here with both halves, is there? I don't think. Maybe this one's both halves. They are rare as hen's teeth now. They, they, they're in museums. Again, there's one upstairs next door. Um, they were used until the, the 19th century. And um, <coughs> there was a lot of them in the House of the Parliament. And somebody decided to get rid of them. So somebody was told to burn them in the stove underneath the House of Lords, I think. And uh, this set fire to the, the houses. Uh, this well-known story, Dickens tells the story. Um, Turner, um, there are apparently more than one Turner picture of a fire in London, and only one of them is, is the tally stick fire. They, I don't know whether this is the right one or not. <coughs> but they were uh, got rid of the, the county for getting rid of the uh, Houses of Parliament as well. <laughs> Um, now, I said there was rare as hen's teeth. Um, very recently, about a year ago, one came up in auction and it was bought by uh, somebody who has a large collection of stuff in the um, a museum in Yorkshire. And I think he paid £80 for it. And, uh, that's the only one I've ever seen physically, uh, but that's a very recent. But they are extremely rare. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, before we can start to do calculation on paper uh, and any, any sort of sensible calculation, we need to change the numbering system. And this started round about 1000 AD, come very, very slowly. Um, Pope Sylvester, who unsurprisingly was in Spain uh, and uh, had contact with the, uh, the Arabs in Spain, um, spoke about it. Um, nothing much happened, but he was he was vilified for it. I'm not quite sure why, but it, it might might have sorry, might have been to do whoops, might have been to do with this. Oh, right. Please, thank you. And here's a picture of him of 
contemporary picture <laughs> what a bad guy he was. <coughs> and then the um, Ptolemy's astronomical tables were um, published in Spain and updated. But again, Spain's a significant thing here because that's where people were familiar with um, uh, Indo Arabic numbers. The real progress stop we made with Fibonacci. Um, he wrote a book called the Liber Abaci uh, in 1200. And he described business calculations, um, and he was also in Italy rather than uh, in Spain. Um, his statue, if you ever go to uh, Pisa, is in the, the Campo Santo. Uh, uh, this isn't my photograph, but uh, it's, it's the most impressive statue in the place, actually. <coughs> so he's obviously well thought of. Um, but having said this, it, not much progress was made. By the end of that century, the bankers were forbidden from using uh, the Arabic numbers. Um, this is partly, I think, because of security. If you look at a, an old document with a Roman numerals written on it, the last few numbers got a, a letter box. There's got a little twist at the end to show that's the last, uh, the last number. And I think they were unhappy to uh, get rid of Roman numerals for security reasons. And they were quite happy with their calculation, presumably. But as things moved on, then um, progress started to be made. And there's one or two prints which show the contrast between the two things. And here we've got the um, two uh, putty, I suppose they are, one with the counting board and one with the pen and paper. <coughs> uh, and obviously, um, Indo Arabic numbers on the uh, on the paper, and uh, paper started to be available um, in, in this same century, in the 15th century. Um, how expensive it was, I don't know, but uh, uh, in a sense, it's very late in the day that the Chinese were wiping their bottoms on paper centuries before this. But why it took so long for Europe to do it, I don't know. Um, and yet another one here, um, contrast between the two things. Here's the, uh, the guy with one set of numbers, here's the guy with his, with his counting tape. Um, again, contrast here with this lovely lady, Arithmetria. And gradually, um, things switched over to normal, uh, the normal the number set that we understand. And then you can start to lay down the rules for multiplication and, uh, and division and so on. And uh, th this is um, a 19th century book which brought to my great grandfather. It was his school, not school, but night school arithmetic book. Um, and it's got all sorts of exotic things in it, like taking cube roots. And it's also got the weight of light, which seems rather peculiar. Um, but as time went on, you get a book that tells you how to do all sorts of quite complicated uh, arithmetic things. And uh, paper, of course, really became cheaper and cheaper as time went on. Okay, now in the east, oh dear, go back, please, thank you. Um, in the east, calculation were done on an abacus. Um, this is a Chinese, I've got lots of examples here. Chinese <coughs> abacus. Um, it's got too many, um, what do we call them, sliders on it. You only need one on the top and four on the bottom. This has got two on the top and five on the bottom. Uh, I don't know why, but it could well be to do with uh, non-decimal non uh, number systems, like hexadecimal or, or whatever. We've only just got rid of those ourselves. Um, Japanese, first of all, <coughs> copied the Chinese abacus. But then they got rid of the, uh, the extra one in the top row here. Uh, the Japanese call this heaven, this heaven and earth. Heaven is the top row and earth is the bottom row, of course. Um, and then round about 1930, they got rid of the extra one on the bottom because it wasn't used for anything. So this is a modern Japanese abacus now. Uh, I think the uh, number of uh, columns on it is, is a fairly standard thing. Um, it's the same uh, as this one here, which I bought in Tokyo. 
um, and how you use your years it is fairly obvious you can uh, you start off with the zero is, is the, the top row down the bottom row top, top row up the bottom row down um, and then you can put numbers on them this way um, in one sense it's not a calculating instrument because it, it doesn't do anything for you you, uh, you you have to do it all in your head and then uh, um, use this to, to put the answer down so it's not a great deal of assistance but um, it, was, it was the way things were done and just like the merchant with the um, counting board uh, big counting board to impress people here's a, a Japanese merchant's abacus notice it's the Chinese format but it's huge, it's about, about so big and I think this was there to uh, impress the customers you, know, you go in and you don't know how to use an abacus it's a poor samurai down on his luck saying can you lend me a bit of money so he flashing his finger on his abacus just to impress it and that, <coughs> that's in the museum somewhere in Japan now this, if it runs keep up on this stuff, yes is worth watching <coughs> there's a very nice abacus shop near this temple <coughs> Here's the little children in schools. And here's the after school abacus class. Now there's just adding and subtracting going on here, but as, you, as it goes on you'll see this starts to do multiplication. He's saying sometimes I hit them. <laughs> now look at the multiplication going on here. Now, this is why it's called a virtual abacus. The abacus has disappeared now. He's just using his fingers on an imaginary abacus. Huge multiplications going on. This uses the other side of your brain to normal mental arithmetic. It's, it's uh, something magic going on. But um, what use it is, I don't know. <laughs> it's a, a nice way of having an after school uh, club. Now, the abacus spread all over the, uh, the east. The Russians use an abacus. Um, again, there's one on the table here. Um, it, they seem to have. Um, again, too many, too many buttons on the abacus. There are ten uh, buttons here. Uh, presumably, these are to do with uh, fractions of, of some sort, money or, or whatever. <coughs> but why they've got ten buttons rather than nine, uh, I don't know. But they're in common use in, in Russia. Okay, can I just say one more thing before we go on to this one? On the table, we've got examples of all these things. And um, uh, this, is, this is really the, the most interesting one. This is a pre-1930 Japanese abacus, um, which I found in a flea market in Tokyo somewhere. Uh, but that's genuinely old. The Chinese things, of course, look old, but they never are. Um, the Russian one, um, I think I bought that in Russia as well, but it's not at all the uh, standard, uh, standard one. And um, these two. This, this is a modern one, it's got the old configuration of five uh, counters on the bottom. And this is the standard uh, Japanese abacus. Now, those kids were using one very, uh, very similar to this. Um, the, the Japanese do it right, they've got little sharp edges on the uh, 
can't what you call these things, um, very easy to move with your fingers, whereas the Chinese ones have got these rather crude uh, lump of things there. Okay, well, let's move on to arithmetic machines. Um, and again, we're moving into the region of boys' toys here, I think. Well, let's have a look at what we've got. Uh, we've got Nature's Bones, which I used to think was something to do with uh, logarithms, but they're not. Um, the chemical adders, machines able to multiply, divide, and then electronic machines, which is the end of, the end of this talk, of course. So let's have a look at what we've, uh, what we've got here. Napier's bones, little sticks marked out uh, like this, and uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on them. Uh, and you arrange them like this. You've got the number <coughs> across the top, so you pick your stick out with four at the top, six at the top, seven at the top, and so on. And then you can multiply that by a single digit by looking along that single digit row and just adding up, uh, right here, uh, adding up at the bottom three, uh, three of six is nine, six and one, and so on here. Um, and then you do the carries in the perfectly normal way and you finish up with the um, top number multiplied by the single digit in the, uh, in the row here. So this is Napier's Mons. <coughs> Um, people knew how to do long multiplication at this time as well. Um, so how how often these things were used, uh, I don't I don't know, but they're very famous. Again, lots of them upstairs. Um, you can see uh, here's a very nice set. Um, I think clearly made as boys' toys, uh, ivory probably, um, laid out uh, in a nice box. Um, adding machines, I'm not going to spend too much time on these. Um, the first ones, or the simplest ones, you simply have a keyboard and you hit the keys and that gets added to something that you've got in the accumulator. Um, here's an example of uh, very frequently uh, seen things that must, must be sold by the million. Um, you, you press the keys, some sort of ratchet device turns the, uh, the counting wheel at the bottom here <coughs> and puts the number you put on the keyboard in there and, and because it's rotating the wheel it just adds it to the number that's already there. Um, now the interesting thing is what do we do about the carries? Um, if you remember the little thing we used to have on our bike to count the miles up, that simply carried uh, in some very simple way. But with these things what happens if you've got a lot of nines along here and you put a one in at the bottom. You don't want to be in the situation where you have to stand up and press very hard on the, the one button to get the, uh, the carry to propagate all the way up. So these things need a device to um, in here somewhere um, to propagate the carry. Now I've got one, a similar thing to this, but I couldn't bring you in there because it's too heavy to, to carry. Uh, that's a little spring device which is set as the wheels go around to nine it sets this spring device so that the spring device can propagate the carry uh, along the, uh, the without without having to put any more energy into the uh, into the button pressing. And um, the, the Pascal uh, adder. So let me go back on that. Um, Pascal's version of this thing. Which, yeah, there's one upstairs. Um, Pascal didn't have a spring loading device, but he thought about this. I think it's quite remarkable considering how early Pascal was. And he has two little weights that are moved around as your wheel goes around between eight and nine. It, it lifts these weights up so that again, if you hit the one at the bottom, it will just propagate up by these weights um, tumbling over. Now, we could spend all day on the history of these mechanical uh, things. Um, but by and large, the, the most frequently used one was the pinwheel. Um, calculator, the Odner and this sort of thing. Um, and here you, you put your number in a, a register um, and then you can add it to the, uh, the accumulator here. Um, but now we've got to the stage when you can, you can shift uh, the register sideways uh, and you can count how many, how many times you've, you've added the register or subtracted the register. <coughs> By this means, you can do multiply and divide. You can do uh, multiply by uh, shift, uh, 
putting each, each number of the multiple count in and then shifting it all and putting the next one in. Uh, not all that quick, it's fairly quick. Uh, that counts as you do it. Similarly with divide, you can do subtractions uh, and that'll do uh, divide. Um, I, I, I don't know who originally invented this thing, this thing but Odin was a very early um, manufacturer of these things. Um, this is the register here, the accumulator here. This is the input register. You just simply move these little sliders around. Um, pins stick out in a big wheel behind them, which, which counts onto the register, the accumulator rather. And here's the counter, which counts how many times you've done it. Uh, these are just clearing handles. And this is the uh, handle which, which does the adding or the subtracting. Again, we've got one of these, but much, much too heavy to. Uh, uh, um, now these two are not the end of the day with uh, um, this sort of thing, but well along. Um, these are actually both difference machines because the, um, the top one here was purpose built to do logarithms and um, it's got a printer at the top here and um, I think it was just used once to produce a, one, one book of log, log tables and then it, it just uh, it was never used again. It's well described in, I think, the same book, um, how it works, but it, it's not quite the same as a, a straightforward Abbey machine. It's a different engine. This machine was built to do 20 digit log, log tables by a guy called Thompson, who I think devoted his life to it. And this still exists. It's in the statistics department at uh, Imperial College somewhere. <coughs> Uh, this is a recent photograph, but um, quite where it is, I don't know. But what he's done here is taken uh, one, two, three, four pinwheel calculators and somehow stacked them so that um, he, he could do the differencing. Um, don't ask me how it works, but uh, so it's, that's the, uh, uh, the ultimate use of these things. Uh, until we get to the real end of the line, and the um, the clue here is in the logo, this thing does square roots. Now, how on earth a maintenance man could fix this when it broke? I've just no idea. I don't even know how it was designed or anything, but it's, uh, uh, it would do square roots. And that was the, the, the end of the line as far as mechanical calculators went. And here now we've got the ultimate boys toys. Somebody's already mentioned this, Kurt. Uh, um, this isn't a pinwheel calculator. It's actually a Leibniz stepped wheel calculator, which wasn't used a great deal, um, but, but this was used. And the guy who um, created it, um, I don't know how much work he did on this, but was in a concentration camp. And he, he came out of the concentration camp and started to get these made. Um, you can tell by the size of it, it's not surprising it was made in Switzerland and I think Liechtenstein. But they're, uh, if you want one, they're about 300 quid. But um, how much practical use they are, I, I do not know. But, but there we go. Um, <clears throat> now, in fact, most of the, uh, the calculation we um, we saw up to the, uh, the edge of the computer, which was probably done by uh, human beings. You, um, you have high, hierarchically organized teams of people down at the bottom level just simply do the sums, produce the next entry to the table. Uh, the guys above them will provide intermediate values uh, for them to work from, and somebody right at the top will devise the alg algorithms for, for doing these things. Um, <coughs> The French famously employed the, uh, the crimpers after the French Revolution because they weren't allowed to be doing hair anymore. Um, during the war, there was a, 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 an organization set up which was doing things like uh, gunnery calculators, gunnery tables, and so on. Uh, and they <coughs> unemployed people um, out of New York to do this. There's a, a, quite a good book written about that uh, episode. <coughs> um, they were used not just for tables, but for big calculations. Um, East Germany, um, who was it? Was it lights? East, East German camera people? Lights? Like 
well, lights. With the yeah, anyway, they, they use students to do lens design after the war. Um, there are photographs of groups of women uh, who use slide rules to do uh, aerodynamic calculations. Um, all, all the tables were done uh, manually uh, up until uh, very recent times. Um, six women uh, who became the ENIAC programmers all came from this uh, uh, human calculator background. And, uh, here's a picture of uh, a couple of them uh, on the ENIAC. So it's a very important activity that went on over the centuries. <coughs> from, from Ptolemy, in fact, it was, we had a look at and saw Ptolemy's tables earlier on. Um, now, far be it from me to talk about Babbage, but I just want to say one thing. Um, I'll skip that one. Why, why wasn't it finished? Is, I'm going to give my views on this. Um, first of all, uh, if you've read David Sobel's book about Harrison, the thing that kicked off the longitude, they not kicked it off, but one of the dramatic episodes was Admiral Sir Clarence Shovel plowing into the Silly Isles. There was no such incident that said, oh, the tables have got errors in them. No, there was no real uh, impetus uh, for the government to say, oh my God, we've got to have proper tables. So I'm not sure how much interest there was. Um, does anybody know how to pronounce shoot? Is it shoot? Sorry? Scheutz, right, thank you, thank you. Um, the Scheutz uh, engines were, were not used very much at all. Um, so I'm not sure what the impetus was to, to create this thing, apart from Babbage wanting to do it, of course. Um, but it could still have been done. The Scheutz engine was done by, the initial prototype was done by a teenager using <coughs> unsophisticated uh, tools like a very crude lathe, files, hacksaws, and so on. Um, but I think that Babbage got caught up with the zeitgeist, and this is this is the best picture I can I can give you to illustrate the zeitgeist. Here's the engineer's hero. You know, no messing with me. Look at these chains behind me. Um, here's his dad with the, the Thames Tunnel behind him, and um, Babbage went to Father Brunel here, this this one, and said, hey, I want an engineer to uh, help me. And he came up with a, a, a guy called Clement. And um, we, we don't know much about Clement, but uh, what I'm going to recommend to you, if you're in, interested in the history of engineering, is read Samuel Smiles. His book, The History of the Engineers, is fantastic. And he describes Clement in it. He's very enthusiastic for him. Um, but that seems to be the only information there is about uh, Clement. But he was brought up in the Oxford and Cambridge of Victorian Engineering, which was Maudsley's workshop in London. Maudsley produced nearly all the great Victorian engineers. They worked, they worked past through his workshop at one, one time or another, and, and Clement did. But I think they got completely hung up with this idea of making something very accurate and working to thousands and, and so on, which wasn't necessary. It certainly wasn't necessary for it to so darn big. Um, if he'd gone to the clockmakers, there were loads of them in Clerkenwell and Liverpool. Uh, they already had machines for making gear wheels. A clockmaker didn't fire out a gear wheel by hand. He had a, a machine for doing it, dating from the previous century. Uh, they might have done, done a better job. So that's my bit about Brunel. Um, here's the finished machine, which you've all seen. And here's the American version done in Bicarno. Um, and we just hang on a second. I think it's called Robertson, isn't it? The guy who did this. Um, the Americans always amaze me how, how they, once they've got started on something, they take it to the very end. You know, if I'm going to build a, um, a 16 cylinder V8 engine two inches long, then I'm jolly well going to do it. And uh, they do the most fantastic things. Um, and here we are. Is it working? We shouldn't have sound on these things. The sound can be amplified. Sorry? You can just hear it. Yeah, you can just hear it. Talk 
obviously not size 10, is it? <laughs> now, whether he claims that this is pure Vicar or not, or there's some special bits in it, I don't know. steam engine. Okay. So I'll put this up just to demonstrate that the, the technology that uh, Clement wanted was uh, uh, far, far in excess. His main interest was making machine tools, actually, and it was a good excuse for making lots of machine tools uh, on the back of uh, Babbage. Well, I can tell you, I've probably got time to tell the story about this, but this, this was a, a good example of Clement, I think. Uh, Brunel Jr. went to him and said, the steam engines on my steam locomotive, the steam whistles, rather, on my steam locomotive are rubbish. Will you make, make me a better whistle? So uh, Clement went to it and said, yes, I'll, I'll do that. Built a special machine tool to do it, um, as was his wont, and came back to Brunel with these fantastic whistles. And uh, Brunel said, those are far too expensive, but that's a ridiculous price for a whistle. And it went to arbitration, and uh, Clement won. Um, so his superb whistles uh, um, had to be made with a special machine tool, and he won. And there was a similar case of him making a, a long screw, which presumably a lead screw for a lathe, uh, for somebody in America. And again, he wanted to charge him, I think it was £200, which you can imagine how much that was. And again, he went to arbitration and Clement, Clement won. But um, he was very keen on making, uh, making machine tools. Okay. Um, there's even a Lego version of, uh, of this thing. <laughs> Uh, not much, it's obviously just a sample there of, uh, of the different engine, but uh, <coughs> you know, there's always a Lego version, isn't there, for all sorts of things. Um, okay, let's move on to uh, machines which do, do maths rather than uh, ar arithmetic. And uh, they all use some sort of analog of the numbers, length, uh, angles, voltage, uh, even water will come to it in one case. Um, they're often special purpose, purpose machines rather than general purpose. <coughs> and they solve mathematical equations and eventually they just evaporate it completely once people run to programs to do it. And the first an analog device, if you like, was uh, al uh, logarithms um, created by John Napier way back. Um, now, <coughs> his lifelong reputation is on. Uh, uh, logarithms, he thought his most uh, best achievement was proving that the Pope was the Antichrist. So, <laughs> so he was the Ian Paisley of his day, this guy, as well as being a mathematician. <coughs> um, but very quickly after he, he published uh, uh, te log tables, uh, Henry Briggs produced usable tables, um, Kepler was one of the first to use them, uh, very enthusiastic. Uh, this is a quote from Laplace. Um, that uh, it shortened their labours, um, so that they they were they sort of exploded in in, uh, in use very very quickly. Um, so it was, a, it was a fantastic achievement, I suppose. Um, very quickly again, people thought, well, we can put this in in a, some sort of graphical form, um, <coughs> and uh, the first example was was going to scale, which is simply. A, a logarithmically laid out uh, ruler. Um, and then Outred put two rulers together. Um, James Watt uh, produced the Soho slide rule. There's, there's not, not a Watt made example, but there are two examples upstairs. <coughs> um, but the Soho slide rule didn't have a cursor, so the, the two scales on the middle um, slider are both the same. So you can transfer from the top to bottom through the, through the scales. Um, who invented the cursor, I'm not sure, but the modern slide rule, um, th this sort of thing, dates to 
1850, this Frenchman called Mannerheim, Mannerheim um, really produced the, uh, the standard model, <coughs> and they've been used ever since. Um, I've, I've said they've got men to the moon, they didn't have much other means of doing design work other than by using sliders to uh, uh, produce all the hardware to get people to the moon. Um, the little slide drill here is an example of a slide that's actually taken to the room as well, the little, little yellow metal one there. Um, and of course they died as uh, desktop calculators and so on came into, uh, came into being. But um, apparently modern engi young engineers don't know what to slide through this. There was uh, some of a friend of mine said the other day, well, what's that? And uh, it's quite, quite amazing how, how progress, as it's called, goes on. Oops, back again. Right. Come on back, there we go. This is going to scale. It just just <coughs> a little bit laid out in, uh, uh, top one, laid out in uh, logarith logarithmic form. Um, no, we we'll move on to the, the sector's part of the same story. The sector um, was let's move again one here um, was part of. If you see those photographs of Victorian draftsman sets with all the stuff in, there's usually a sector in it, and this is a multi-purpose gadget which you use in conjunction with your uh, dividers. Um, it's got on it. Uh, I think this one has somewhere, uh, a log scale, so you can use it like a, like a yes, here we have a seat here, look, this bottom one. You can get your dividers out and add two numbers from this thing, and that will produce the uh, multiply count, multiplication. Um, but you can also use the angle to do things like proportion. And um, it's, it's disappeared, but um, it was a, a common thing in Victorian times, and presumably everybody the draftsman was taught to, uh, to use them. Um, if you go to uh, Chucksworth, you'll see Cavendish's instruments. There's an extremely posh sector in the uh, glass case with his instruments in. Um, I suppose he could afford a nice one. Um, then the slide wheel moves on. This is the uh, normal form now. Lots of different makes of them. Uh, you can, the search is on to extend the length of the scale, that was the thing. These things, um, I suppose they went up to about two feet, but not, uh, not much more. So how do you get to a long scale? Well, one way is to wrap it around in a circle. Uh, this foul, is it a fowler? Can't see, probably. Um, went around in circles. Um, this one, the Otis King, um, which was very popular, um, spiraled the, uh, the numbers around the <coughs> uh, round a tube. We've got one, one here. Um, and all you have to do is add uh, two lengths of these things together. They're quite easy to use. You could really go to town by increasing the diameter of the tube, which is what this one does. And um, I don't know how easy these things would be to use. It looks extremely difficult to use to me. Um, very slow. But this is the slide rule that Neville Shute talk, talks about when he, his autobiography is called Slide Rule. And this, this is the one that uh, he, he, he refers to. Quite why you needed it to design the uh, it R101. Um, I'm not sure, but uh, that's it. Now, the next stage of uh, analog machines is Lloyd Kelvin. Um, and he produced quite a lot. There are, there are two upstairs. Um, uh, there's a, another slide predictor, another tide predictor, and um, another one which he calls the harmonic organ analyzer. Um, this is another version of the uh, of the tide predictor using pulleys and um, other mechanical gadgets. I can't see what to uh, work out the. Uh, uh, the, the tides. So this was something using a purely mechanical device to do tide calculations. And in the 19, late 1940s, 1950s, um, somebody produced a water-driven um, machine that was 
uh, simulate the economy. And um, quite a few of these were made. I'm quite I'm surprised there's one here, actually. Um, and you have um, things like tax and so on flowing through valves, and uh, the whole thing's driven by water. And, uh, there is, one. is there? Is there? Yeah. Where? On, on the second floor? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. There we go. There is one upstairs. But um, judging by the recent year's performance in the economy, they probably they should have dug it up and filled it with water. It might have done a better job. But, um, there we go, that's the Phillips economic calculator. Water. <coughs> and then we've got the um, differential analyzer uh, being brought to life again in Manchester. Um, they're doing quite well, actually. Um, and this was used for all sorts of things. Uh, said to be used for the bouncing bomb, uh, nuclear physics, artillery tables, and um, we can't see much of it here, but the uh, the tricky bit of it is that the um, the integrators are a flat disc with a little sharp edged wheel on it, and there's very little friction between these two, and um, so you have to put in a thing called a torque amplifier, which um, takes a lot of getting going. The, uh, you even have to research the sort of string you use in it to get it to work. But they, they've got it going now, or most of it, most of it, like, anyway. We'll draw nice circles. <coughs> and again, Vicano, and uh, this was a, 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 not just a demonstration thing, it was actually used in anger, I think. And here we have the, the torque amplifiers. Here's the um, glass disc and the friction wheel here. And it goes into the torque amplifier to then <coughs> go on to, into the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the machine. I think this was built in Manchester, right? The, uh, <coughs> and another device now for calculating areas is the planimeter. Um, this is a nice, um, fairly simple one. Um, you, you have a weight here which stays in one place on the, on the table. Um, you go around the area with this pointer here and you can read off the area you've got around on this, uh, this wheel here. <coughs> there are dozens of different configurations of planimeters. Um, so this is a fairly simple one, but there are others which are much more complicated. But they, they work very well. Um, you can also get a very simple planimeter, um, and you won't get much simpler than this. It's simply a it's on the table here, um, a piece of the uh, bed bar with a, a wedge, knife edge on one end, <coughs> on the other. you put it down in position one, take your knife edge, no, sorry, your pointer around the area, you don't have to go to the middle and back again, you can stop on the edge. The knife edge will have moved somewhere on, on, the, uh, on the table, and if you measure this distance here um, and multiply by the length of the device, <coughs> that'll give you the area. And um, it, again, it works quite quite well. I don't know what the accuracy is, um, but commercial ones were made. Um, where's, where's the thing? The commercial ones made with a, 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 a curved root. You can measure the. Uh, circumference there, not a straight line between H1 and H2. We're made with a curve here, with marked out with uh, uh, inches, so you can you can measure it directly with your with your gadget. Um, so that there were commercial versions of this. So that's um, my version, but um, there, are, there are commercial versions of it. Um, now, carrying on from things like the um, uh, the Manchester machine, there are all sorts of uh, analog devices built during the war for doing for things which needed calculation. This is a, and I think this was made by a Ford. Um, this is our uh, shipboard uh, machine for doing gunnery uh, calculations, and um, it's it's full of all sorts of bits and pieces here for doing the calculations. 
Here the guys manning it, somewhere way down below decks. And um, so was, I think that was purely for doing uh, gunnery calculations. But there were others, um, for example, the tote uh, is a mechanical, it was a mechanical device, invented in uh, New Zealand. And I think this is the tote, first tote uh, machine that was made. And uh, you all know what I mean by the tote, of course. Yes, the, uh, you, you put money on the race. Um, before the race is over, you've got to calculate how much money has been put on each horse, what the total amount of money is, <coughs> in order to calculate the payout. Because people will come rushing to the, uh, the payout desk as soon as the race is over. Um, and here's uh, 1913, that's the origin of this thing. Uh, an incredibly uh, um, complicated looking machine. It would presumably worked. Um, but that's uh, another example of a special purpose uh, calculating machine. There are also things which just work with levers without any integrators or, or wheels or anything. And um, I think quite a lot of different, different versions of these things were made. Here's a very simple one. Um, I'd like to get hold of one of these actually. You simply put the, uh, uh, put the number on here and um, what's it do? Point to it does the product. I think it says point to two numbers that will yeah indicate their product. So it does multiply uh, by these two pointers. Yeah, we've got four and ten, and those pointed to forty. This is just done with a few levers behind the uh, tin front here. Um, and here's a, a, a an aeroplane loading uh, calculator. Again, all just, just levers behind here. And you turn the knobs, according to what load you've got on the plane and everything else, <coughs> and the answer comes out to these two uh, things up here. But, um, and this isn't the only one by any means, it's, it's not a, 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 a one off by, by any means. And then, oh, sorry, yes. go back. This is the end of the day for this sort of thing. This is a case on one computer um, full of electronic integrators and multipliers and adders and so on and you configured it with a, a patch panel here um, came out in the 1950s i think i once uh, used one of these things but i wasn't allowed to go near it because it was kept by the um, strange people behind the behind the door you had to give you your information <coughs> and uh, they, they gave you the answer back that was when i was a a graduate apprentice at the nuclear power group who had one of these things. But it's all gone now, as, you, as we all know. Okay, and um, here's the end of the, the show completely. Um, this is the first all electronic uh, desk calculator um, using decatron tubes, I think. Um, so that was uh, the 1960s, and here's the first microcomputer-based um, calculator. Especially a special deal is done between Intel and, uh, and Japanese manufacturers to, to produce a four-chip set uh, for this thing. And uh, so all the mechanical things are now uh, gone out of the window. Okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, comments. well, there are probably people here, here who can answer the questions better than I can. Go on, carry on, if anybody wants to make a point. Not so much a question as a comment. Yeah. With that um, gun, ship or gunnery computer, yeah. a couple of weeks ago I found an interesting film on YouTube, US Navy, yeah. um, actually describing how the various parts worked. It's a yeah. training film. It's quite. I think I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. quite interesting yeah. Yeah. how simple each part was. Yeah. But putting all the different bits together to do the job yes. must have been quite yeah. Uh, yeah. complex. Yeah, I think I've seen that. YouTube's a gold mine of things like this. It really is. Yes.
Yeah, just a couple of uh, uh, co well, a comment and a question. Um, you, you showed clearly the clips of the Japanese children with the abacus. I mean, the abacus is undoubtedly in skilled hands, a very fast device, um, which is perfectly capable of doing multiplication. I wasn't sure that I <coughs> saw an explanation of where the drivers were to move away from Roman uh, numerals. I've always thought it was the Lombards and banking and the need for um, what today we would recognize as decimals, basically fractions, in order to do interest calculations, which was their contribution which are essentially undoable yeah. in Roman notation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I welcome your thoughts on that. The, the other thing uh, that I came across in some research I was doing, um, we forget, of course, that the whole strength of an abacus is you do multiplication without needing to know multiplication tables. Yeah. And if you go to English, early English books online, which is the uh, website which has the early printed books in English. Um, you'll find in the, sorry, it's a few years since I did this, I'm pretty certain it's the 17th century, that about 20% of books being printed, different books being printed, um, are, are basically gentlemen's introductions to arithmetic. Mm -hmm. And if you actually look at the chapters, you realize what they were having to do was to learn how to do yes. multiplication yes. by literally yes. learning the multiplication tables yes. that we took yes. for granted. And this was because they were abandoning the abacus and in particular the counting table. Yes. Yes. Um, and it, it's something that I was quite unaware of. Um, I, I welcome your thoughts though on the driver for the transfer away from Roman to what is actually a less efficient, slower way of doing calculations by hand. Yes, yeah. The, um no, that's, that's an interesting point. I, I, the whole of this um, business of arithmetic is, is there's very little about it. Nobody wants to talk about Roman arithmetic. It's, it's just a it's a no no a no go area completely. Um, and of course, if that's a no go area, then all, 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 everything afterwards up until we get rid of Roman numerals is no go. And um, the, uh, the there's some lectures again on YouTube from Gresham College. And they just simply don't mention Roman. We skip from the, you know, it's all Greek. And uh, so, it's, so you, you're probably right about that, but I don't think there's any, any evidence. Yes. I suspect that's a gentleman here. Respond. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to respond. Just to throw a comment. Um, on the continent, they use the comma where we, we would use a decimal place. Yeah. This is a throwback to putting a little squiggle at the end of a complete number in Roman terms. Could be. I don't know. No, it's just observation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My kind of response to it, on the basis of no evidence whatsoever, is that it, it, it's bad. Could it be to do with dumbing down in a way that the longbow sort of succumbed very quickly, even though muskets were as good, uh, because it was the amount of training you had to do uh, to be proficient? without answering my own question. I think you, it, 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 the, the reason I mentioned early English books online was it was clearly a massive um, change uh, in which merchants had to learn multiplication. My a particular interest of mine which led me to this was I was looking at ready reckoners, printed sets of tables which yeah. sold in the millions up, well, yeah. probably some of us in this room actually remember being in offices with thundering great yeah. things the size of telephone directories, yeah. if you remember what those are, yeah. um, <laughs> um, <laughs> sitting, uh, <laughs> um, sitting on the shelves. Um, and, and those started um, roughly around 1600. Uh, uh, they, they, they began to be printed and became a huge business because they saved people, in part, from having to learn to multiply. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Um, oh, Dan, sorry. I'll see you behind. Hi. Um, 
make an observation on the on the tote machine, which I, I actually one evening did go to the dogs to have a look at one. Yeah. That's um, your excuse. That's my excuse. Uh, one of the interesting parts of it was that the legislation that allowed you to do that sort of bet required that anyone in the arena should be able to see what was going on in terms of the total amount bet, the amount bet on each possible wager, which is either a dog to win or a dog to be placed, two dogs to be placed first and second or first, second and third, yeah. which is why you only ever get what the limited number of dogs you do in a dog race. Because if you had any more, you'd have an enormous room full of stuff. But that very big, <coughs> tall scoreboard at the end of the dog track yeah. Yeah. shows all those figures in little windows. Yeah. And the real aficionados are actually watching those through binoculars, apparently, <laughs> rather than watching anything else that's going on. But those numbers are updated as the individual bets come in. Yeah. Yeah. So that there's a link from the mechanical table and sometimes um, it's, there's a sort of dial giving you a rough idea of the odds. And that's done by driving um, a horizontal uh, value for the total back against the vertical value for the, the particular odds that you're showing. So that you, you know, it, it's an amazingly complicated system, all done with string and serial wax <coughs> Just like and, and, and little electric electric yeah. motors and electromechanical yeah. clutches. Amazing. Yeah. Um, but the one of the other interesting things is that it came from Australia and it arrived at the same time as Speedway, which is why you find dog tracks and Speedway tracks on the same side. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But the one you saw was mechanical just like... It was a, a, it was a Julius <laughs> machine. Yeah. yeah. There was a video of it somewhere, but I've lost it. Or at least my copy. <laughs> I spent a time in New Zealand and they were always telling me that they invented the toast, so yes. There you um, go. Uh, two things. Um, you mentioned Calvin and the integrator. Uh, it's worth mentioning that the integrator was a much cleverer device for working out what the, t what the tides did to give you the constants to put into the, similar, the smaller machine that uh, various ports yeah. could have to work yeah. out their own yeah. local tides. Yeah. So that, uh, and that's a glorious piece. The, the integrator is a lovely piece of machinery. Anybody hasn't seen it should nip upstairs and look at it. The, the, the ball and the cylinder. Uh, the that's desk. right. Well, there were yeah. six yeah. balls, and they yeah. had to work out the various harmonics yeah. and the moon yeah. and the sun and whatever. Ah, well, it's yeah. uh, one of the many things it doesn't explain upstairs is what you've just said. Well, I think, yeah. I think yeah. Martin Campbell Kelly might know more about it than I do. But, um, mm -hmm. um, the other thing to mention is you haven't got a very simple computer in your connection which is a thing that all pi private pilots are taught to use, they call a Dalton computer, which is a circular dial on a slider, which does a vector triangle addition yeah. for you. So you've got a certain crosswind, you're heading in a certain oh, direction, yes. how yeah. much do you need to kick off the drift to make sure you go where you want to go? Um, they're about 50 quid. Yeah. From, uh, they're getting more expensive, actually. They're a lot more expensive now as a pocket right. calculator. Yeah. But um, they're dead simple, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and I've got one. Oh, all right. So that's how they did it. I often wonder how they did it, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's called an E5A as well, I think. Yeah. <laughs> computer. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the stuff that you've talked about so far has all been done with the decimal readings. Now, as some of you spent recent times faffing about with emulation on the Leo 3 computer, I know that radices can be different from decimal. And I just wonder if you've encountered calculation regimes in which the radix is not decimal. After all, the imperial system of units completely delights in all sorts of, you know, not just oh, yeah, uh, yeah. even five and a half yeah, yeah. yards to a rock pole or perch. Yeah. Well, uh, all, all the lists, as far as gadgets go, um, uh, this must have been created for another number system to. Uh, uh, to accommodate another system as well as decimal. Um, what we get up to here? Somebody help me here. Um, that's 10 and uh, 50. It's derating 16, wasn't it? Yeah. So we used 16 for weights, didn't we? Yeah, we did 16 ounces to a pound. Yeah, so you could have been, this could have been a, a decimal as well, but you'd use 16 base numbers as well. Could it even explain? 
the way that the Chinese abacus seems to have an extra ring on each thing because you could get away with four and one rather yeah, yeah, than five yeah, and two. Yeah. If it do, if it do cal calendar calculations, if you do sixes, yeah, six and yeah. ten, might be a lot of simpler than that here. Yeah. Um, to, to add to, you actually saw a non-decimal um, calculating machine on a slide and it went unremarked. Um, if you look at the slide of your Roman abacus, yeah. which, which uh, are, are, I, I'm trying to remember and I'm afraid I'm forgetting, um, that picture is from, I think it's an Italian museum, I haven't seen the original, but I th it's usually attributed, I think, to an Italian museum. If it's not Italian, it's German. But if you look at the uh, right hand... This one, you mean? Uh, yes. yes. If you look um, at the... Um, if you look at the right hand... Oh! There we are. Uh, it's... Yeah, it's, it's oh, I do beg your pardon. That one isn't what I thought it was. Um, you but mean, can I mean, this, 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 this yes. is not... Um, uh, yes, you will find that there are illustrations the same as that in which the right hand end um, has, in fact this one, uh, so it's only got two. Um, basically you will find them for Roman currency, which remember yeah. went 20 shillings, as it were, to the, what, to the yes, modern, yeah. in English, yeah. 20 shillings to the pound, uh, 12 pence to the shilling, and it included farthings. And you will find yeah. ones where, the, at the right-hand end, you have just a short uh, slider for counting quarters. The, the, the point I made earlier yeah. about decimal notation. You, you, they, they, Roman nu nu numerals can candle think a, a, a given fraction, yeah. but it counts quart quarters, not in the sense of two quarters is a half, but one quarter, two quarters, three quarters, and then you do the carry. Yeah. Those of us also of a certain age, you will remember another hangover, which is attributed to the counting table um, uh, for the same reason. Which is, do you remember going into Montague Burns, gentlemen? Um, you you may well have been charged thirty nine and eleven uh, for a suit, or uh, a little bit more, yeah. but right and. The shillings stopped, not at 19, it was very common to go right up to 99. And that was because, that is alleged to be because of columns of, multiple columns of 10, basically counting in hundreds in shillings, and then doing a carry to actually a five pound, and then onwards in the way oh, you were illustrating. Yeah, yeah. But, um, so, but you will find uh, Pascal, some of the Pascal engines, again, are not decimal additional. Oh, all the way. Yeah. They, they, they start with 12 yeah. pennies on the first yeah. wheel, yeah. and then 20. Yeah. So, so, so the answer to David is yes, yeah. they right. did build currency yeah. ones yeah. in particular. Yeah. Yeah. My uncle worked at Burns, so we always got a discount. So <laughs> <laughs> Done. Yeah. Um, I never bothered my mother so I've, I've hogged the microphone back here again. Um, one of the, uh, the other things that you'll find upstairs, which last time I looked for it was tucked away behind all these um, sort of Pascal and, and Leibniz machines, is a little device by Sir Samuel Morland, Master of the King's Mechanic, um, which is basically wheels within wheels to do additions. But in the text, uh, describing it, and, and there's a text which contains that plus the analysis, published by the New Common Society and still available after about 40 years, we haven't sold them all yet. Um, the great thing that Morland claims for his little <coughs> adding machine is that it'll work in farthings. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Two quick things. First of all, in Japan, I lived in Japan from 88 to 90. They'd only just stopped using Soroban in banks for doing the calculations yeah. in back office because they were quicker than calculating machines. Yes, yeah. yeah. The other one is just another reminder that back in the 1961, I was a graduate, uh, um, no, undergraduate apprentice at Nikut Haru, who had actually worked at the place computer and programmed it for them. Oh, right. I plugged them full plug boards and actually... So you were the guy behind the door then. You were the one here. 
<laughs> so it was actually programmed with the initial settings were all done through a punch paper tape. So you actually punched all the initial settings in paper tape, you read them all in, and set all the potentiometers automatically. Oh, okay. Okay. That must have been a later model than the other one has a picture of, I think. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it's a bit, they're slightly different yeah. machine. They were two yeah. joined together, they yeah. were run separately. Yeah. Each had 100 amplifiers. Yeah. And I think it was 16 multipliers. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you. <coughs> it's crystal from the metal. On the slide where you talk about the human computers, I don't know if you're aware that there's a, that there's a well known meteorological example. Uh, the, the original equations for numerical weather prediction of the atmosphere were written down by a Norwegian called Buchanan <coughs> at the end of the 19th century. And the first attempt to calculate, to solve them numerically, was by Lewis Fine Richardson. He was a Quaker and a conscientious objector and worked as an ambulance during the First World War. And he used a hand calculator to do the first numerical weather prediction. It was a six hour forecast. It took him six weeks to do, <laughs> and it was completely wrong. <laughs> um, but to be fair to him, he published his results in 1922, and later on, it was an American, French American uh, mathematician who realized the mistake he'd made. He'd not eliminated the sand waves, so the solution was dominated by sand waves. But he actually proposed uh, the Royal Albert Hall having 64,000 computers in it. Uh, all calculating and passing their results <laughs> backwards and forwards. And so, yeah, yeah. so the base, you know, the, the, the ground would be uh, Antarctica and up in the gods mm -hmm. would be the poles and there'd be a conductor in the middle uh, with a, a red light and a green light keeping pace with calculation. Uh, unfortunately, he also made another mistake there and uh, he, he got his estimate wrong and he'd have actually been 28,000 people in calculation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Uh, I'm John Young. I looked at um, AWE Blacknest, which uh, is a seismology group. And when we first started um, processing uh, seismic records, they used a base analog computer. And the settings for the base analog computer were actually calculated on the mainframe computer on site. <laughs> so it was uh, used a digital computer to compute the settings for the base computer. Um, also in seismology, of course, the, um, the famous Jeffries Bullen tables were actually done by um, human calculators, and it was rumoured that it took them about yeah, many yeah. years to actually compute all, all the, 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 the various tables that uh, were, were published by Jeffries and Bullen. Yeah, they're, uh, they're tremendously important in the history of uh, you know, getting things done. Yeah. When all these very really regular books were done by hand, I mean, somebody calculated. Yes, but your remark about the um, the abacus and the calculator, there's this famous episode, isn't it? The American, the GI in Japan in competition with an abacus. And uh, the abacus beat him hands down in addition, uh, a little bit I think on multiplication, but he only won a bit on, on division. Well, that's uh, a very famous story that one. Isn't it? But how many people could come to the level of uh, Right brain or left brain activity that those kids did. I can't be that many people. It was the Don't people. tell Michael Gove whatever you do. Please, it's all tennis happening in the age of five. <laughs> Sorry? The kids are taught to use the age of five, and at the age of seven, can do four digit mental arithmetic and then get to be five digits. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I'll do it. I'll do it. Hello, Dave. Well, I remember you from. I used to work for Peter Turner. Okay. Oh, right. Right. Yes. Anyway, yeah. my first involvement with computers was actually an analog computer at the time that you showed there. It was a late World War II ACAP control system whereby you took bearing elevation and range and polar coordinates by microsoft from a radar, worked out where to put a shell, told the gunnery site, they parked the shell there, and the aircraft flew into it, was the idea. Yeah. One of the problems with it, and it didn't actually work very well for this reason, is that if you're in polar coordinates, it's rather difficult to have a translation. Translation is just a difficult for polar coordinates. And of course, that meant you had to put the gunnery at the same site as the radar. Now, if you've very carefully spent months aligning a radar system accurately, the very worst thing you want is something going bang in your body. <laughs> so it didn't actually work. But what we were using it for was working out the programming for the V-bomber force. 
we actually were set up to bomb Newcastle, Glasgow, Liverpool and London and one other, I can't remember where it was. And they would take this, just driving a plotting table, working out the maths to program into the MVS system on the, on the big bomb for us. So that was the first element of computing I ever worked with. Yeah, yet another, did you ever take the lid off to find out what was inside? <laughs> yeah, it was all uh, Wheels but highly linear potentiometers. Yeah. And, uh, it, was, it was electric, so no. it drove no. pots. Yeah. Basically. Did you ever want to eat I mean, there's one point about, <laughs> we were talking about the pace analog machine, there's one point about that. If I had to do a calculation, I would have trust the pace more than the program in the, in the uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, struggle with, uh, what's it called, SPICE, the uh, analog simulator program. Never stable. And uh, so maybe the pace lasted a bit longer because we don't trust that software. I think it's uh, better use the pace. Sorry. Thank you. Can I just interject a further story about analog computers? They can be good for your career. Andy Herbert's undergraduate final year project was actually on analog computing. Uh, and could I please ask a question which has intrigued me for years? Measurement and calculation like this are somewhat related. And I have a steel ruler that I inherited from my uh, father-in-law. And it has marked on it something called the London Circum. Google doesn't know the answer, but it does show me a picture of a steel ruler like mine. If anybody here knows the answer, I'd love to know what it really is. But I think it's something about being able to use the ruler for calculation. Thank you. Did you try applying pi to it one way or another to get it to a diameter of a... What, do you think it was a circumference of a circle? Is it smart or a No, I've never seen that. No. Well, thank you again very much, David, for this, and thank you all for your contributions. <laughs> now, the advanced programme for the um, next season, 2014-15, is going to be up on the website soon, um, but I can already tell you that the um, first session on, in September is on the 11th of September, and it will be the first about the 1900 and then also in September there is a meeting another not a meeting a present a, a visit